Good evening. Welcome to the Hampton History Museum's Port Hampton Lecture Series. I'm Alan Holman. I'm the curator here at the museum. And tonight we have a special presentation to mark the 160th anniversary of the uh, contraband decision handed down by General Benjamin Butler at, uh, at Fort Monroe here in Hampton. Uh, we are co collaborating with our friends out at uh, Fort Monroe to, to bring you a series of events. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Matthew uh, Laird, who is partner and senior researcher with the James River Institute of Archaeology Incorporated. He's a native of Ottawa, Canada. He earned a PhD in American history from the College of William and Mary, and over the past 25 years he has worked as an historian and archaeologist in the cultural resources management field. Dr. Laird directed the 2014 archaeological investigation of the Grand Contraband Camp site in Hampton. This project furthered his interest in archaeology uh, of urban African-American sites, which began when he helped to unearth the notorious Lumpkin Slave Jail in Richmond's Shaco Bottom. Uh, the presentation tonight will be uh, about his work here, uh, working in conjunction with the History Museum here. Archaeologists and historians of the James River Institute for Archaeology unearthed Intriguing physical and documentary evidence of Hampton's Grand Contraband Camp, a Civil War era African American community which developed in the shadow of Fort Monroe. Uh, so, Dr. Laird's presentation tonight is called uh, Searching for Slab Town The History of Archaeology, History and Archaeology of Hampton's Grand Contraband Camp. So, please, uh, while you've joined us on Facebook Live, uh, in the comments section, ask questions, and at the end of the lecture, I'll be happy to relay those to Dr. Laird, and we'll, uh, we'll try to come up with some, uh, some good answers for you. So, Dr. Laird. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Alan. I appreciate it. It's great to be here live and in person at the Hampton History Museum, and I'm especially excited to have the opportunity to uh, recall and share with you the results of a very fascinating and very important, I think, and significant archeological uh, investigation which we collaborated with the Hampton History Museum back in 2014. Um, in the early days of the Civil War, a momentous event took place in the waters of Hampton Roads, an event which would help to change the course of American history. But it's not what you might think. On the night of May the 24th, 1861, so exactly 160 years ago this very evening, a little more than a month after the Civil War began, three African-American men named Shepard Mallory, Jim Townsend, and Frank Baker climbed into a small boat and began rowing across Hampton Roads from Sewell's Point to Fort Monroe. The men were enslaved to Hampton resident Charles King Mallory, who had loaned them to the Confederate Army to help build fortifications around Norfolk. Now they knew that Fort Monroe was still in Union hands and they hoped that if it, they could just make it across the water they might secure their freedom. And that's exactly what they did. They survived their perilous trip across the mouth of the James River and the next day they were brought before Major General Benjamin F. Butler, commander of Union forces in coastal Virginia. Now, before the war, Butler had been a successful Massachusetts attorney who represented a number of working women in industrial injury cases, so he was very sympathetic, naturally sympathetic to their situation. Although he could not legally free the men, as lawyers often do, he came up with a clever workaround which turned the Southerners' definition of slaves as quote-unquote property against them. What he did was argue that any property of the enemy, including enslaved people that might be used to support the rebellion could justifiably be seized as quote unquote contraband of war. President Lincoln and the US Congress eventually acknowledged this novel legal category. So while they were technically not free, any enslaved people or contrabands, as they came to be known, who came under the jurisdiction of the Union Army would not be returned to their former owners. Needless to say, this decision and its consequences infuriated Southern slaveholders who now faced the prospect of a mass exodus of their valuable property. Now, once word of Butler's new policy began to spread, Hundreds and eventually thousands of African American men, women, and children took the opportunity to liberate themselves, and they began to 
Sorry, I've had a technical request here. I need to get to full screen. If you'll excuse me for one moment. Does that look, does that look better from in there? Yep, excellent. OK, continuing. So literally hundreds and eventually thousands of African American men, women, and children took the opportunity to liberate themselves. And they began to converge on Fort Monroe, which soon became known as Freedom's Fortress. As their numbers swelled, Butler established two camps for the contrabands, one near the fort itself and one in the ruins of the town of Hampton, which had been burned by retreating Confederate forces on the night of the 7th and 8th of August of 1861. Sorry, let me get caught up with my slides. The ruins of Hampton here in 1861. Although they received some assistance from private charitable organizations, especially the American Missionary Association, the new arrivals in Hampton were largely responsible for their own support. Now, most able-bodied men worked for the Union Army as officers, servants, drivers, laborers building fortifications on the peninsula. And many enlisted in the US Colored Troop regiments when recruiting began in earnest early in 1863. Meanwhile, many women earned money cooking and doing laundry for the troops. Now, the army levied a contraband tax of $5 per month on each household, which was intended to provide support for those who were unable to work, but it really left the newly self-sufficient families with very little disposable income. Housing, as well, was always in very short supply in Hampton. Initially, Many of the contraband scavenged av available building materials from Hampton's ruined buildings. And observers like New Hampshire soldier William Channing Thomas marveled at the makeshift cabins which adjoined the surviving brick chimneys. They have not a house with a chimney, he quipped, but a chimney with a house. The housing situation did improve considerably after April of 1862 when Captain Charles B. Wilder, who was the assistant superintendent of freedmen in the region, established a steam-powered sawmill a few miles outside of Hampton. Soon this mill was producing up to 5,000 boards per day. These rough slabs, as they were called, which contraband families used to build their cabins, gave Hampton's new African-American settlement its informal name of Slabtown. The sprawling community, which ultimately expanded beyond the limits of the old town, was intersected by streets the contrabands renamed to celebrate their newfound freedom, including Lincoln, Union, Liberty, and Grant Streets. Robert Hamilton, the African-American journalist and publisher of New York's Anglo-African newspaper, visited Hampton in December of 1863. He was greatly impressed by the strides the contrabands had taken in building their new community. The evidences of destruction brought upon the village by the rebels when they burned it, to some extent still remains, he reported, but the energy of our redeemed brethren is fast hiding the debris of destruction. Many of our people have started little stores which will soon grow into large ones. Massachusetts author J.T. Trowbridge also gave a sympathetic assessment of Hampton's emancipated African-American community. When he visited the area during his post-war tour of the recently defeated southern states, he found Hampton to be, in his words, a thrifty village occupied chiefly by freedmen. The former aristocratic residences had been replaced by Negro huts, he said. These were generally built of split boards called pails, overlapping each other like clapboards or shingles. There was an air of neatness and comfort about them which surprised me, no less than the rapidity with which they were constructed. One man had just completed his house. He told me it took him a week to make the pails for it and bring them from the woods and four days more to build it. A sash factory and blacksmith shop, shoemakers, shops and stores enlivened the streets. The business of the place was carried on chiefly by freedmen, many of whom were becoming wealthy and paying heavy taxes to the government. Every house had its woodpile, poultry and pigs, and little garden devoted to corn and vegetables. Many a one had its stable and cow and horse and cart. 
So anyone who visited the grand contraband camp and met its residents could not fail to recognize that the quaint old Virginia town had been replaced by something new and remarkably different, a thriving community established and maintained almost exclusively by freedmen. So despite its significance, there's actually a surprising lack of evidence about what the contraband camp looked like during the Civil War years. And we're very fortunate to have two slides uh, which were taken in 1864, and they are on file in the Library of Congress now. This first one that you can see, this is a view looking out over the ruins of Hampton, and you can see uh, these various houses which were built by the contrabands. Again, many of them were occupying uh, houses which had been burned in Hampton, and the brick chimneys were still standing, and they would build their, uh, their slab structures against these. So this is one photo, and this is a uh, uh, close-up view of one of these, and so I think you can get an idea of what the housing was like. So these are relatively, you know, quickly built, roughly built houses with the uh, lumber that the Union sawmill was producing and shingle roofs, and I think you can also see there's a whole variety of fencing and other features in, in this area too, so all packed um, fairly closely together. So how did we become involved? In 2014, the city of Hampton contracted with our firm, the James River Institute for Archaeology, based in Williamsburg, Virginia, to conduct a preliminary archaeological investigation of what they felt was the likely site of a part of the Grand Contraband Camp in downtown Hampton, Virginia. So I have a map up here on the screen. The star indicates roughly uh, the location we were looking at. And what really precipitated this study was in 2012, just a couple of years before we began our archaeological investigation, the Harbor Square Apartments, which dated from the late 1960s, uh, which had occupied this entire block, which was uh, bounded on the west side by North Armistead Street, and on the north by West Pembroke Avenue, and on the south by Lincoln Street, that apartment complex had just recently been demolished a year or two prior. Um, it felt that there was fairly strong evidence to suggest that this block in downtown Hampton had been occupied as part of the Grand Contraband Camp. Uh, the land was and still is held by the Hampton Housing and Redevelopment Authority. And so the city of Hampton and the Hampton History Museum thought that this would be a great opportunity with the recent demolition of the apartments to do an archeological investigation to see whether there was any potential for surviving archeological remains which could be definitively linked to the contraband camp of the, of the Civil War period. So at that point, they contracted with my firm, the James River Institute for Archeology. span My background is in history, and so the very first task that we had to conduct was really some more background research to try to figure out, was this area really part of the Grand Contraband Camp? And, and if so, what might we expect to find in this area once we did an archeological study? Um, a lot of you who are familiar with Hampton's history will probably recognize this 1878 Gray's new map of Hampton. Um, the area that I've circled, essentially, it, it, it roughly includes the project area we were looking at, but I think you can see there's really no specific indication, just a sort of general area that's labeled Grand Contraband Camp. So we knew that it was generally in this area, but we really don't have any very precise documentary evidence of exactly where the camp was located. And the, and the surviving evidence and the photographs really tend to suggest that it really was kind of per pervasive throughout the ruins of uh, the recently uh, burned town of Hampton. So as we began doing the research, I stumbled upon what I think is actually probably the most exciting part of this investigation, this discovery. As we were looking at this property, obviously it had been apartments for quite some time since the late 60s, but we knew from a whole variety of maps and other city records that this had been a thriving uh, block with many, many urban lots which had houses and businesses and churches on them, predominantly in African-American neighborhood. And, in downtown Hampton. And so I started to drill down and do more documentary research at the courthouse in Hampton to try to figure out the ownership history of at least some of the lots of the area that we were looking at. And what I found as I got back in the records really surprised me and find it very significant and it really says a lot about 
what was happening in Hampton, not just during the war years when the Grand Contraband Camp was occupied, but what happened immediately after the Civil War, which I think is a fascinating story, which I don't think we hear enough about. But what I learned was, focused on one particular lot in particular, looking back at the history uh, of what had happened here, essentially what I found was that this entire block, in fact, this whole entire section of what is now downtown Hampton, at the time was sort of on the northern fringes, fringes of the, the settlement, had been owned by uh, a large Hampton area landowner named Jefferson Bonaparte Sinclair. So he owned this large plot of land. It looked like up until the time of the Civil War, it was largely undeveloped. Um, and when the war broke out, he retreated to his property in Gloucester County and he spent the war there. He was pretty much financially ruined by the war and when he died, was essentially bankrupt when he died in 1869. And so many of his properties, including this property in Hampton or in neighboring Elizabeth City County, just outside the Hampton town limits, was actually subdivided for sale. And what's fascinating is the way it was subdivided, I think it's pretty clear that it was intended for African Americans to purchase these lots, probably many of the people who had been already living in the contraband camp. But I found one particular lot in particular which coincided with the area we were looking at was purchased by a man named Merritt Thomas. And as I'll describe in a little while, we were very fortunate to actually meet some descendants of Merritt Thomas while we were doing this investigation and they were able to provide us with some really fascinating genealogical information about the family which really helped us sort of flesh out what was happening on this particular lot. But just in general, what was happening with this property uh, during the Civil War and immediately afterwards. So this property was subdivided in 1871 and it's clear from uh, the city's uh, land records and deed records that very soon all these lots started being purchased by African American people in Hampton and Merritt Thomas bought this one lot. They were about quarter acre lots, measured um, about 55 feet by 212 feet long and the entire block was divided into these lots. And he purchased this lot, and what's fascinating is that this particular property actually remained in the extended Thomas family up until the 1960s, when this whole area fell victim to what was happening in, in, in many cities throughout the country, and uh, urban redevelopment and you know, so-called renewal uh, destroyed a lot of these neighborhoods, and it was at that point that the Harbor Square apartments were built. So I think what's really fascinating that we learned from this is not only was this area most likely occupied as part of the Grand Contraband Camp, but just given its specific history and the fact that this land was subdivided and available for purchase, what it allowed was the creation of an entirely African-American freeholding neighborhood in the town of Hampton right on the fringes of the town of Hampton in the very early 1870s. So this is the very earliest period of reconstruction. And now you have people who only just a few years before had been enslaved and had taken the opportunity to liberate themselves, come to Hampton, were living in the makeshift situation of the grand contraband camp, but through their own toil and efforts and their, and their uh, opportunity to start earning an income, they were actually able to purchase their own land. And in many cases, we know that the descendants of these earliest contrabands who arrived in Hampton and these earliest landowners in Hampton are still living in Hampton today. It's really fascinating, and we've had the opportunity to, to meet some of these people and to kind of share this. They've shared their family information, and we've been able to share some things with them as well about what we actually found archaeologically. So it gets complicated because, so we start looking at this particular property. We wanted to try to find any intact surviving evidence of the archeological site. Well, we knew we were gonna have a lot of obstacles in our way. As we started looking at um, city maps and tax plans and insurance maps of this area, we could see that most of the lots had houses or stores or churches that uh, faced the street front. Um, when we started overlaying these maps on the recently demolished um, Harbor Square apartments, we could see, and in fact, those concrete slab footers of those apartments are still, they're just kind of slightly buried and grassed over now, but they're still there. 
So we wanted to try to avoid the later 19th and early 20th century house sites which were along the street because we knew that would have disturbed the earlier archaeological remains. We also had to avoid uh, all the utilities and buildings associated with the Harbor Square apartments, but we were able to target some specific areas that looked like they had been undisturbed. And so they were essentially in what would have been the middle of the block. So we're off the streets, kind of in the center of the block, and we picked three different testing locations that we were gonna look at. And the area was not large, all told it probably encompassed about 2,000 square feet. Um, so we, we picked these three areas to investigate. And so what were we expecting to find when we went out there? Well, we knew from the available photographs and records that the earliest contraband houses were pretty rudimentary and they would have been very similar to the sort of you know, basic frame structures that people had been living in in Virginia really all through the colonial period and up into the 19th century. And um, if you're familiar with Virginia archeology, span you know that post and ground architecture or setting the house post directly in the ground was a common form of architecture. And so we thought very likely this is how they were probably building these, these contraband houses as well, these slab houses, and so we thought it was very likely that we might find architectural post holes, and so you can see this is a, an example of what we would see archeologically, the remains of a post hole that's essentially rotted in the ground, and so it's essentially showing up as a soil stain, and in this one slide you can see that's a cross section of a, of a post hole that's been excavated, so you can see the, the remnants of the wooden post in the center and then the post hole surrounding it. So those are one type of feature that we thought we would probably find. Also, it was very common in enslaved housing in the 18th and into the early 19th century, it's very common uh, for, these, for these dwellings to have a root cellar, or, um, what we would call a subfloor pit, technically in archeological terms. But essentially it's a root cellar, kind of a shallow depression, usually in front of the hearth. It's often used to store root vegetables over the winter and often people would kind of secure their valuables in these things too. So we thought there's good potential that we, you know, especially if people were carrying over the sort of housing styles that they were accustomed to when they had been enslaved, that it might be uh, expected that we could find that. And again, what we're looking for is essentially just a, a soil stain in the ground. So this would have been the root cellar that was backfilled with a darker colored soil that we would find as we strip the topsoil off. Um, it's quite possible that we might find wells for drinking water. And this is actually a well which we excavated also in downtown Hampton a few years before this project down across from the uh, Air and Space Museum. And so it was, this was a potential feature type we would be looking out for. And also we knew from those Civil War era photographs of the contraband camp that there were a lot of fences that seemed to be demarcating individual lots and people's garden plots and, and possibly even keeping livestock. So we knew it was a possibility that we would be finding fence lines as well. And this might help us figure out where individual homes were and lots. So this is what we were looking for when we started. So essentially May of 2014 is when we began our archeological investigation and I think you can see from the slide we we opened up these three targeted areas which we had pinpointed using a backhoe and so essentially stripped off all the topsoil we only took off about a foot or so of soil and almost immediately as soon as we began we started finding dozens of these archaeological features that we had been interested in finding so this is just one of the areas that we mechanically stripped with the backhoe and I think you can you can get a sense of just the constant sheer number of these features that we found, a whole concentration of things. So then the task became, you know, trying to sort these out. And so in total, we identified over 170 individual features. So this included things like uh, possible root cellar, like we've just been talking about, privies. So this would have been outhouse pits. Uh, a small barrel well. So essentially they would have dug a hole and then lined it with wooden barrels to kind of create the, the structural framework for the well. Trash pits filled with just domestic refuse and the types of things people were getting rid of and fence lines. So basically all the types of features that we were hoping to find were showing up almost immediately in these areas that we, that we opened up. Um, really fascinating. We were able to 
sample. Now, this only went on for about three weeks. So we really didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of full-scale excavation, but we were able to sample about 26 of these features just to get an idea of what they are. And so in this picture on the, in the left-hand side, this was the barrel well, which we were excavating. And you can see on the right-hand side is a trash pit. There's a large butchered cow bone that you can see in there and other post holes and features. Now, what really became the challenge at this point is it's very difficult to distinguish when you're looking at artifacts of what would have been deposited there during the grand contraband camp period. So of the, the war years, the early 1860s versus we know that these lots were subdivided in the early 1870s and being occupied by uh, African-American freeholders at that time. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish in terms of dating artifacts or features between the 1860s and 1870s. But we did have some clues that what we were seeing really were the remains of the Grand Contraband Camp. For one thing, this area that we were targeting was really in the interior of what would have been laid out as the lots in the early 1870s. So just seeing the density of features were there, it would have been unusual for people to have that much activity, concentration of use and activity in the very back of their lots. What was also fascinating was that as we started looking at fence lines and other features, they were not oriented according to the current street grid, which was the one that was basically imposed on this area in the early 1870s when the lots were first laid out. So the fact that we start to see things that are not oriented with the street grid make us think that these were created before that area was subdivided. So that's an additional clue that th these features were related to the Grand Contraband Camp as opposed to kind of later occupation. But the more we thought about it, the more we came to the conclusion that in some ways it really didn't matter. Obviously we were intending to try to find evidence of the Grand Contraband Camp, and I, and I think we did. But even if some of the features we're looking at do date to that very earliest period of African-American uh, freeholding and these lots, that's an extremely important time period too. And so just that evolution from the contraband camp to this established neighborhood of freeholders, in some ways it really wasn't necessary to distinguish because they're both really critically important to understanding you know, what the experience was for African-American people in Hampton both during the Civil War and immediately afterwards in their, their first years of freedom. We did find an interesting array of artifacts, all the types of things you would expect to find on a, a site that had been occupied during the Civil War years. We have, there's a you know, partially intact raccoon skeleton which had been buried, so we don't know quite how that wound up in the trash pit. And there's a, a Union Navy button from the early 19th century, and we know it was very common for uh, freedmen to often have items of surplus military clothing that they had been given by the by the military, and so that, that may have related to that. All sorts of kind of domestic artifacts which we would expect to see on a site where people were living. So got an example of a spoon and scissors, personal items like buckles and buttons. In total, we found about 1,100 artifacts, which really isn't an enormous sample, but again, you have to remember, we were really just doing a preliminary study of some very limited areas to try to see, is there any potential at all for intact remains? And the answer is yes. And what's fascinating is you really don't have to scrape very deeply below the surface. And if you're familiar with that area, it essentially just looks like a park today. If you walk out there, literally just inches below your feet are the remains of the Grand Contraband Camp, which have been preserved for um, nearly 160 years now. It's really amazing. So, we were very fortunate, and again, this was an event which was sponsored by the Hampton History Museum. We had an open house at the site in July of 2014, so this is right at the end of our archeological investigation. This was a fascinating opportunity to meet. As I mentioned before, while we were working, we really had the advantage of, and in one case, our excavation area was literally right next to Armistead Avenue. So people would be driving by and they would stop and they would see the archeologists working and they'd stop and talk to us. And it was, it was through just one of these chance conversations that we got to speaking uh, with these two ladies in particular, Renita White and Patricia Thomas Redwood, realized that they were actually descendants of Merritt Thomas who had first purchased the very lot that we were working on in 1872. So to be able to make a connection with them, 
and other members of the community, people whose ancestors had been contrabands arriving in Hampton in the 1860s, was really fascinating. And just the extent of community interest in learning about this history, recognizing that there was this hidden resource of archaeology right in their own neighborhood, which no one had ever discovered before, was really fascinating. So it was a, a great opportunity to, to meet people and share, to learn from them about the history of their families and what their experience had been, and for them to realize that there, there really is you know, untapped potential for archaeology and history right in their own community. So, I think a lot came out of this, even though it was just a very brief and preliminary archaeological investigation. I think it's fascinating to see it's opened a window into what was going on in Hampton, not just in terms of the archaeological remains, but the documentary evidence as well. I think it would be a fascinating subject for someone for their master's thesis or PhD dissertation to look, even if you studied just this one block in Hampton and traced the ownership of these individual lots and who the people were. There was a lot that we were able to tease out about the Thomas family. I'm sure that would be possible for many of these other lots as well. And to try to make the connection between people who arrived in Hampton as contraband, as recently freed enslaved people, and then taking that next step to land ownership and business ownership. And um, it's really a fascinating time period. And I think there's a real untapped source of you know, documentation available on that the opportunities for public engagement. We could see that you know, it was possible to meet people who had um, ancestors who had lived in this area. And so to kind of make you know, this history come alive for the people of Hampton, I think, was an important opportunity. And there's a lot of potential for that and just learning about the history of the community. So at the time, we had put together a proposal. I think there's a lot more potential. We really just scraped the surface of, of what's there. Obviously, there's been a lot of disturbance from various things over the years, most recently the apartments, but there are a lot of areas still on that block in Hampton which are probably undisturbed and have archaeological remains. I think we demonstrated just in the few weeks that we were working out there just what the potential is. So it would be very exciting. I just drove by there on the way here this evening, and I can see that nothing's really changed since 2014 on the property. So the, I believe that the city still owns the property. I think that there's a lot more potential for archaeology there in the future and a lot more to be learned. So we hope that eventually you know, that, may, that may go forward. So thank you for the opportunity to share this information. It's been, it's been great. It's been several years since we've worked on this project, but wonderful to have the opportunity. It's probably been one of the most exciting and meaningful archaeological and research projects I've had the opportunity to work on. So pleased to be able to share that. And I hope that if you have any questions or comments, I'd, uh, I'd love to address them now. So I think Alan's, Alan's back. And it looks like you have some questions. I do. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Let me, aha, uh, this is from Jonathan. Uh, how did Hampton acquire the land to build the Harbor Square apartments? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'd have to go back and look more carefully, but I think as the, the Housing and Redevelopment Authority was, was purchasing and, and maybe in some cases condemning large portions of the area for what they would have considered you know, rehabilitation or, or clearance of these areas. So my recollection is in the late 60s, they purchased or condemned all these lots from the individual owners at the time. And that's, that's what led to the um, creation of the apartments on that block. Uh, do you have any plans to return and continue the work there? Well, w if anybody invited us, we would be happy to come back. There's no, no current plans to do it. But like I was saying, we did put together a proposal because at the, at the time, I mean, the, the point of this was really to see what the potential was. This wasn't the, you know, the final say in what was out there. And so we did put a plan together for what the next steps could be. I think that what we would do if we were to come back and the funding were available, if the city or someone else was able to sponsor this, is look at a wider area across this property because we were just really looking at very small windows of you know, what had been the former contraband camp. If we could extend this and look at a larger area, I think there are a lot of exciting questions that we might be able to address. I mean, right now, we don't have a very good idea. 
about you know, how this community developed. Did it sort of emerge organically? Was there more planning to it? If we could look you know, at a larger swath of area there, I think we could start to get a better idea of you know, how it developed, how it was laid out, how it kind of operated as a community rather than dropping just these very kind of small windows into it like, like we did. So we would, we, would, we would be glad to return at any time. <laughs> I have a, uh, a related question. Uh, should you return, would the public be invited to join with you? Absolutely. I think that would really be critical. It was during the first phase of the investigation, and it would, it would really have to be so. Like I said, this is really a, you know, th there wouldn't be any sort of better community engagement project than this. Um, we would, we're always welcome people who have an interest in archaeology or people who you know, share history with the site. I think that you know, there's a lot of potential for using the documents to learn more about this, but there's no substitute for people's family histories, their genealogy, there's so much. We know that just from studying this one Merritt Thomas a lot. There's so much that can be learned from, you know, the families themselves and researchers, and, and it's really that collaboration with the community that's really going to help. You know, Fantastic. make this we, more understood. Obviously, we're a museum. We love to invite the community in to help us it's got to be tell the story. Uh -huh. uh, and this is from Shelton. Uh, did you check any of the... Hi, Shelton. Uh, <laughs> did you check any of the dates on uh, graves in the nearby cemeteries? And if so, what did you find? Yeah, no, we really didn't look at cemeteries as part of this. But I, again, I think there's so much potential for kind of pursuing this research because I think that as you look at the documentary records, you can start to track who it was, who was purchasing these lots. Now, as anyone who's done you know, African-American genealogy knows, it's often very difficult to find a lot of information kind of during the Civil War and pre-Civil War. But there are ways to sort of tease out who may have been arriving during the Civil War years. And you st even looking at the 1870 census, I was able to see various families who seemed to be living together consistently and the evidence seems to be that they may have been living kind of side by side in the contraband camp and then purchased lots and st still remained in the community. So, I mean, to take that example of cemetery, I mean, just looking at the genealogy, the family relationships, there's a lot to be learned, I think, about how this community developed. Okay. Um, here, let's see. Okay, this is from ER. Uh, if Hampton was mostly black after the war, uh, when did the white folks return to reclaim the city? Well, this is interesting because it actually started happening right after the war. A lot of you know, the white residents had left after the city was burned, and they did start arriving back in Hampton afterwards. And it was an issue because in some areas of the contraband camp, I mean, essentially these people were living on someone else's property who had abandoned it. And so the federal government essentially considered it as confiscated land. But there were lawsuits after the, after the war, and white residents started coming back, and there were African Americans who were displaced. What's fascinating about this particular property we were looking at is just given its own kind of individual history, it was subdivided and was actually sold, you know, legally sold to African Americans. So there was really no opportunity for someone to come and you know, reclaim the land. But it did happen in, in, not just in Hampton, but in other areas as well. But, you know, these people were able to save enough money to purchase these lots, and then it, it belonged to them, and it was remained, you know, in their hands till the 1960s. Very good. Um, let's see. Oh, did you consult with the nearby churches uh, that were established during the period? Uh, in your work? Yeah, we did. We, we, we did a little bit of that. But again, we know that there were churches that were in this area. Um, you know, and so it would be very important, again, to you know, talk to anybody who has a connection to this as well. And so there's, there's a lot of potential engagement that you know, we would definitely want to pursue if we continued this. Because that was an important part of the story. These people established businesses, established churches, um, you know, their own self-contained neighborhoods. And so any information would be very helpful along those lines. Uh, I'm, I'm scrolling back to a, a past a question uh, earlier. Uh, obviously, Hampton has a, a story that goes uh, back farther. Uh, just as a rule of thumb, how much deeper did you, would you dig to reach the older records like colonial period? Yeah, so in this particular area, 
we were essentially down, and, and I think you can get an idea just from this picture, see the people, we're literally just several inches below the ground. We've actually, at that point, we are through all the cultural deposits in that area. And so there's actually not anything early or underneath. I think okay. what's happening in this area, because it was on the northern extent, it was pretty much an undeveloped area up until the Civil War. And so I don't think that there's as much potential for finding you know, pre-19th century archaeological remains in here. They may be scattered. This was essentially undeveloped land. But we, we are, we're just a few inches below the ground, and we were through all the cultural deposits that, that are there. And so the features we were finding are things that would have been dug deeper, like post holes, trash pits, anything that's down okay. kind of into the natural subsoil layer. So I, not a lot of potential for anything earlier here on this particular lot, but we were very happy with the many hundreds of features that oh, we very, did. Very good. Uh, which brings me to a question I have. Uh, how much disruption uh, would have been caused by the development in the 60s and then the removal of that development yeah. just a few years ago? Yeah, a lot. Um, like I said, yeah, the it's concrete, only a few inches below yeah, the surface level. Yeah, it's really been crisscrossed by utilities. The concrete slabs that the apartment buildings were on are still there in the mm -hmm. ground. They didn't remove those. So, yeah, there is a lot of area that's inaccessible or disturbed throughout that block. But I guess what we were able to demonstrate is that there are patches of area and scattered throughout that are intact. But you know, it's not a it's not a pristine archaeological site. A lot of disturbances, and so. You have to be very careful about you know, pinpointing which particular areas. And that's what we did, kind of overlaid all the maps and the modern maps and aerial photographs and utilities and tried to see, you know, pick areas that were understood. Okay, and there, you, are, there are some, but you know, it's, it's But you're able to determine before you start that this is a, an area that is, is probably undisturbed relatively. Right, uh, okay. exactly. But we were able to pinpoint, so we opened up these three areas in our proposal for kind of a second phase, we probably had about 10 or 12 other potential locations and presumably they would have sort of the same density of features and artifacts as these. So there, there, there are more areas to look at. Okay, well, uh, that seems to be our questions. Uh, looks like we've got work to do here to push forward <laughs> your proposal and get this work going again. So I'm going to make my way back into camera view. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you again for joining us this evening. Uh, if you have any more questions, we're still a little bit of time left, so uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and shoot them to me. Uh, otherwise, we will, uh, we will uh, draw to a close here shortly. So, so I'm going to stand by here awkwardly, waiting to see if any more questions come in. I should also add that also happy to field any questions. I know some people may be watching this at uh, a later date. Of course, day. yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, am, I am remiss in not mentioning that. You can continue. You can find this presentation on our Facebook page, uh, on our website. And feel free to, if you, if you find your way to it in a different format than live, uh, to send us our, your questions. We'll mm -hmm. forward them on to uh, Dr. Laird and uh, hopefully get a good answer for you. So. All right then, well I am not seeing any further questions coming in. Um, so thank you for joining us this evening and we will see you uh, live uh, the first Monday of uh, June post holiday. So that would be, I believe, June 7th when we will be having our next Port Hampton lecture. So thank you very much again.